Welcome to the S2 Cognition Podcast. S2 is the official cognitive evaluation in sports, from youth to pro, where athletes and coaches build to win. We're glad to have you here on the S2 Cognition Podcast, so thanks for joining us. I'm your host, Harrison Hunter, and today we've got part two of our conversation with Seth Hazelhoon. In part one, we discussed how Special Operations Forces operators are constantly facing speeded cognition decisions. Seth Hazelhoon, our honored guest and one of my favorite people to work with, is a Special Operations Forces mental performance specialist. In part two, he dives into why normal brain games and apps and other mechanisms can't capture speeded cognition and why training in the environment in which you perform is key. For those that are new here, we welcome you. We're excited to have you here, and for those that are returning listeners, we always appreciate your support. To help us continue our growth, we ask that you please subscribe, rate, and review our show. Enjoy part two. Seth, thanks for coming on today, man. This is going to be really exciting for us. I'm excited to be here. We're looking at capacity. And so we're looking at the system level capacity. And those are those capacities are pretty well formed by the time you're in your your early mid twenties. And so we're mm-hmm. looking at, at, you know, where are the areas and you apply those capacities to whatever environment you're operating in and performing in. And so it's not the same, you know, take, take the S2 evaluation, do some training, see if you make it better. It tells you where you need to do training, whatever context you're operating in. And so the value is then to go into the military training environment and say, hey, we need to create more impulse control opportunities no, here and train them. I'm glad you brought that up because that's one of the things that we're getting the most out of the feedback sessions is, oh, we've identified this cognitive um, disadvantage here. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, man, that's perfect. That's exactly like I feel that all the time. All right, so how can we use these so that you can more specifically prepare yourself for situations in which this is going to be really important, right? If this That's is what's your, most important to them. If this is your disadvantage and and we agree on this, like the science, the nerds say that it's right and your experience is 100% accurate to that, then all right, what situations do you have coming up where these are going to be important or these are going to be tested or these are going to be pushed around? Well, I got this coming up or I got that coming up. All right, cool. So how can we use these advantages, like your ability to even like the perception speed and search efficiency, right? If we take that and explain it as your ability to intake information from your environment, like you're really fast and specific because your perception speed is through the roof and your search efficiency is good enough. So you're taking in a lot of detailed information and you're doing it in a hurry but you're also kind of understanding the environment as a whole, just from being able to take the information in, but your, you know, your decision complexity is kind of suffering here, right? Does that make sense why your decision complexity would suffer because you're taking in so much information? Yeah. Oh yeah, that makes perfect sense. All right, cool. So if you're in a situation where you have to, no kidding, make complex decisions and you know that's coming, then what do you think we should do? And just let them work yeah. it through it. It's like, oh, yeah. man, I need to be prepared for what the rules are, right? Because that's how we explain it to them. If then rules and options. Yeah. All right. So, like, I'm not the military expert. I'm not a special operator. I don't try to pretend to be one, but I understand their environment training, at least the training environment, as well as anybody. And so it's like, all right, well, these are the things that I was thinking is like, you should be looking for like, if this, then what? If that, then what? If this, then what? And so you can prepare those things because your response flexibility is pretty good. Yeah. Right. And if those two are related and once we understand how they're related, then those guys are like, got it done. See ya. Thanks. Yeah. Otherwise you could go spend tens of thousands of hours on some generic training mm-hmm. that's not guaranteed and probably unlikely to transfer to that specific context. Yeah. It's about performing in your context more efficiently. Sometimes you can just engage in some of these adaptive strategies. There's quick mm-hmm. fixes. Yep. And sometimes there are things you can do, like you were talking about impulse control, mm-hmm. learning how to titrate between being a little bit impulsive and, and quick in your decisions and what that trade-off feels like versus being a little bit more deliberate and having a little more controlled aggression in a situation, what that feels like and trying to figure out better feel your sweet spot. And so that requires a very specific kind of training in the environment in which they have Mm -hmm. to engage. I'd much rather see these operators 
training these cognitive systems in these environments that are very real and personal and the environments they're going to encounter than some kind of generic training. Right. And that's and that's the key to the castle from my professional experience is that because I've I've got enough trust and enough experience that I'm out there with them. And sometimes that means I'm out there for eight hours to talk for five minutes, right? Yeah. But in that eight hours, I'm understanding the context and understanding their goals and understanding where they're at. And then it's so when we do get results back or when they do come to me with, hey, man, like I'm struggling with this part of this, I'm shooting the wrong target or I'm not shooting accurately enough or I'm like, I can't do, like I'm just struggling with whatever, then I can put it in that context. And they've all, everybody's looking for a shortcut. Yeah. Right. And like, always cheat, always win is one of the rules of gunfighting. Right. And so they're really good at finding like, what's the most efficient way to overcome this thing. And there's lots of brain training apps on iPhone. Lots of them. Lots. And I get that question all the time. Hey, luminosity or elevate or peak. Like I like elevate and peak just because they're more fun. Right. But, you know, early, early research in that was like, oh, there's some promise here. But I think it's pretty conclusive at this point where it's like, you're just getting better at that game. Yeah. Right. And that's one of the things that I really like about the way that we've implemented S2 is that we've taken it completely out of their context. They are playing catching balls on screens game. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Using methodologies that have been been firmly established by some of the sharpest and brightest cognitive scientists in the world. For decades, right? Yep, for decades. And it's like, this is no kidding, just the science of it. And so we're taking away your military experience. We're taking away your military expertise. We're taking away all the context clues. And we're just getting a super accurate snapshot of how fast computing power. How fast and accurate your brain is, man. That's That's it. it. And then when we plug this back in, the results back into the context of it, of what they do specifically, where they do have a lot of experience and they do have a lot of expertise, then it's just like hit the ground running. Right? Because we can communicate it, right? Frankly, that's why I pushed so hard to get S2 is after our our initial couple meetings where it was just kind of feeling this thing out, it was like it wasn't the fact that the data that we're getting from you guys is valid and reliable and precise. That wasn't it. It was that you demonstrated that you could use this data to impact performance on the field. That's the part that we're always missing because we can do HRV and we can do heart rate and we can do respiration rate and we can do all of these things, right? And we can help you control your HRV and we can help you control your heart rate and we can help you control, like, that's all physiology. Like, I'm looking for the mechanism of action that causes all those physiological changes, right? Because that's the psych part of it. And so once we understand, like, once I frankly had to learn that the psych part is not the mechanism of action Mm. necessarily, right? Some of it is this kind of hardwired stuff and the way that we perceive it, we perceive our experience through it, and then once we perceive our experience through it, that creates the belief systems that start to impact the psych stuff, right? And then we can use the physiological stuff as an indicator. But like, it doesn't make any sense to me to like, oh, we're going to train you how to, to change your HRV outside of the context that you're using it. Absolutely. Because it's not going to be useful. But if we can get to the mechanism of action that caused that HRV spike, now we're getting somewhere, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And we've been able to do that... Um, with a couple different modalities. And I think, like you said earlier, we're just starting to understand how we can plug in what we're learning from the data that we're getting from you into like everyday training there. We're just starting to understand it. We're gonna need to play with it a little bit. Um, I think the shooting simulator is the easy button to, to start that because it is accurate. It's mostly reliable. Right when it works, it's mostly reliable. <laughs> it works. Yeah. yeah, it's like when sixty percent of the time it works every time, right? So, Anchorman. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> but those scenarios that we've built on the shooting simulator that replicate some of the S two stuff, yeah. Yeah. the guys are into, and some of them that came with it. Remember the one where it's like, "Hey, the target's red. As soon as it flashes green, shoot as many rounds as you can. Stop as soon as it flashes red, and then it stays that way." And like, the timing is a little bit off. Yeah, right. And right. It's like. Oh, uh, well, you were, you know, point, you know, three milliseconds over the line. It's like, well, that signal was already sent. Like, right, okay, we can right, play that. But right. it's it's better tool than we have in Live Fire. Yeah, that's right. 100%. And the shooting simulator is a great supplement 
for live fire training. It's not a good substitute. But because it is a good supplement, then it seems like a pretty good avenue of approach to really start opening some eyes in terms of ex- not necessarily exposing their mm. their disadvantages, sure. but certainly it's a safe area because like it's a laser that comes out of there. Nobody's getting hurt. Yeah, they're using their guns. They're they're bringing their guns over. We swap some parts out, and they like to do it. It's fun, right? So we've got all the conditions for adult learning happening right now. <laughs> adult learning. <laughs> and we can do. We can make all the mistakes that we want them to. And we can push the limits and we can, we can, we've been able to get guys to do some incredibly fast and accurate things in a shooting simulator that they can't necessarily replicate when there's an actual bullet coming out of there. But from a mental standpoint, from a cognitive standpoint, and then trickles down to the physiological standpoint, these guys are, most of it's competition shooting that we're getting the results from is that the competition shooters that are bought into this, like some of those early guys that you get, that you guys met, they're still coming, they're retired. They're still like sending me messages on Instagram being like, hey man, watch this video and this is where this happened or this is where that happened or like, did you see this? And like, I really like, I'm feeling that and feel, yep, cool. Okay, how can I train that? Oh, try this or that. One of those two will probably work for you and they'll go out and try it and be like, yep, got it. And then, oh, this one, this one fell apart or whatever, you know, it's it's always a moving target, yeah. but um once we put it in their hands, again, in the context, and I don't, I don't know that it can be, that I can say it enough that the real value of the test is, or the assessment or whatever we're calling it, is those words have different That's, meanings, I right? <clears throat> and word and meanings are important. Yep. And so because we can take them out of the context, but they've bought in on the process, and then get the results and then plug those results back into their context, that has been, bec- that's the part that sold me on it, is that, all right, this is legitimate, this is real, I get it from a research standpoint, cool, but that doesn't always translate into real life, you guys know that? Absolutely. And so, so far, the research part is translating directly into their real life experience with it. And so now all we have to do is plug into that real life experience in a training environment where they can make a lot of mistakes and it doesn't cost them anything. And now we can play with it. And once we start playing with it, that's where the learning starts to happen. Yeah. Right? I think this, this has been such a, a rich and, and learning and rewarding experience for us because coming into this environment, if we were to come into this environment without having a translator like you involved, we'd have been toast. I mean, we'd, we still would have assessed something valuable and something real using the best methods out there for, from the cognitive sciences, but you need that translation into the environment. And so this is why it's, it takes this collaborative synergistic exchange to make this really impactful. And so we're, we're obviously very real excited about uh, your ability to take this and translate it and... Um, Man, really appreciate uh, your investment in this process. No, it's been it's been great because it's really, like I said, it's really answered a lot of the the questions that I just didn't have answers to. I, I didn't have the technology to do that, I, and that's why we started with a PowerPoint doing working memory games, right? Yeah, military yeah. calls them Kim's games, and we're just playing these. And it's not real science. I'm just trying to try to make you feel bad enough about your ability to do it that you'll listen to me talk about it for two minutes, right? <laughs> like that's the best I could do for him. And so being able to bring in some legitimate science to it that has the backing that not only makes it feel special because it's the the cutting edge, but is also legitimate, right? It's not an app on your phone. It's like this is legitimate then bringing that in and making being able to make it relatable has is, is really been the point that has driven it home. And I know you guys are doing a lot of work with baseball, and baseball is always close to my heart, right? Like the hitting part of it, I wish I would have had this as a hitting coach because, it, like, we've been right about our intuitions on hitters yeah. for a long time. Yeah. But 
it's no different. It's like, oh, how many how many home runs have you hit in the big leagues? Yeah, shut up. Yeah. Right? Right. Like, <laughs> like, what are you going to tell me about this nerd? Right? Yeah. It's the baseball yeah. players are not that different than special operators <laughs> in a lot of ways. But okay, well, I can prove this to you. And like, oh, did you? Oh man, that felt just like I was in a bat. So now, what do you got for me? Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so now it it just helps us give them more specific feedback. And we're not just grasping at straws anymore, right? Like we, we've got specific answers to specific questions. And I've got to say, you've got to be one of our, our best at translating. Like when we come in and we sit in and we've heard you talk to these guys, we've heard the buy-in, you're explaining the process, you're making it relatable. I, Scott and I have looked at each other and we've been in the room, we're like, holy smokes, this guy gets it far more than a lot of other people that we work with. And so hearing that conversation that you have with them, right, you've got the buy-in, we brought the science, and now we're combining them to mm-hmm. then help their performance. I think that's where this is just so synergistic. No, I, I agree 100%. And the translation part is really just the product of five or six years of me screwing it up on my own, <laughs> right? But having the the ability or the the opportunity, I like to think of things, right? I'm supposed to be the sports side guy, so yeah. we're going to be positive frame and optimistic. Okay. We right? frame it right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Then the opportunity to just be pushed out the door and said, go do the stuff, go be out there with them, go do it and like take my bumps and bruises along the way, uh, trying to figure it, figure these guys out and, and get their individual buy-in so they could teach me. Right, like I'm smart enough to figure out, like, okay, I need to understand the people, and I need to understand their goals, and I need to understand what they expect from each other, and I need, like, that's how you get acclimatized, and that's how you get bought in, and that's how you become an accepted member of the group, mm-hmm. and we start to do all the stuff and things, and then once that gets there and it starts to open up, like I've screwed it up a lot more than I got it right for sure, right? But we got enough of it right that we're starting to push the ball down the field in a forward direction for the guys. And that's really what all of us are here for is for the guys. So that's right. If we can find the best way to help them with all the things that they're tasked to do and their willingness to go do those things, then we're um, all in on it. Seth, do you think there are different cognitive systems that are dependent on specialization, right? So infantry versus marksmen or snipers, whatever they're designed to do when they're, you know, out in the field. I think that was both of our hypothesis when we started. Right, is that the guys that are doing um, more like SWAT team kind of stuff or urban combat are going to rely on different cognitive systems than guys that are doing long range engagements. And I think the data has shown that we can't really separate right now the guys that are successful in the long range engagement game compared to the guys that are real successful in the urban short range engagement game, right? Like, those guys that are successful there, it doesn't necessarily have to do with one cognitive skill or another. Is that accurate to the like, yeah, the I way think, that I'm portraying the, the data as from the reference group? Yeah, I mean, I we certainly appreciate that there are individual differences and those have effects on your performance in certain training environments. Mm-hmm. But in terms of determining those between group differences, to the extent that you can call them different groups because they all get trained on a lot of similar things and they're probably, even those who might specialize doesn't mean they weren't perfectly capable of specializing in another area. So it's not as clean, you know, it's not like you have a offensive lineman versus a quarterback. Okay. Um, Yeah. That's a good example. You know, an offensive lineman that weighs 350 pounds versus a, you know, a quarterback. Those cognitive demands, those differences, well, there might be some areas of overlap, but I mean, they've got different skill and physical sets. Um, so, I, I, I mean, you could in, you could educate us a little bit better. I mean, do you think those skill set differences are, are more related to their, their interests or their capabilities? Mm. I would, that's exactly where I was going is I think that it's probably more motivation and interest than it is cognitive capabilities. So yeah. far in the reference group, we haven't found any like real outliers, at least on the low end. We found some outliers on the high end, I think, right? but we don't have a whole lot of outliers on the low end. And so one of the things that's been important with using S2 cognition is that we're not using this to eliminate you from consideration for anything. So like when you, your results are not going to prevent you from going to a school that you want to go to. 
right? Because we don't know those performance things. And the data set's not really suggesting that, like, this profile, if you will, is going to is indicative of being like a shooty shooty boy, and this one is like more indicative yeah. of you being on the like the intel side of the house or whatever the situation is. But it has been interesting and, and illuminating to take the training that I've got to have essentially just being a person in the room and helping them like the pedagogy side, right? Sport pedagogy is like the teaching part of this. And so a lot of the work that I do is with the instructors about how can we get this training more specific. And so now that I've got a better understanding of the actual cognition part of this, right? Not the psychology necessarily, um, not the physiology necessarily, but the actual cognition of what's going on, then it's helping me help the instructors in a better way. So like, let's take long range marksmanship, right? Like your stereotypical yep. sniper yep. situation. Then we were talking early on, like just kind of hypothesizing, like which cognitive skill sets are gonna match, which like tactical skill sets. If I remember right, like we were both kind of thinking like, oh, you know, distraction control is probably going to be really important for a long range marksman because, man, you really got to like, we're talking about precision fires here, right? And at the end of the day, it's kind of like, are we swinging or hitting, right? Like from that conversation before, it's oh, like, yeah, it's relatively easy to teach anyone to lay really still, right? And hold still something on top of another thing, right? Like a reticle on top of a target. Like any deer hunter can relate to this. Anybody that's ever shot any kind of any kind of weapon system can relate to this is like if you want the bullet to go where you want it to, you have to align the sights and then break the trigger without moving them. Yeah. It's relatively easy to teach somebody to lay on their belly, build a position, hold the reticle over the target and then squeeze the trigger without moving the sights, right? That's relatively easy. The distraction control seems to be more applicable to like shoot, move, communicate kind of stuff. Yep. yep. Right. Where we're multiple targets, multiple positions, time sensitive. That one seems to be popping hot. A strong relationship between distraction control and ability to handle multiple target, like unknown where there's situation. time pressure. We time saw pressure. that we in have, our data yep. as well. Where the yeah, low yeah. distraction. High spatial awareness, high distraction control. Those guys seem to do better in a stress shoot or if we're thinking about like on the civilian side, yep. those would be your competition shooters, right? Your competition shooters would have high spatial awareness, high distraction control, and those guys are probably going to be better at that than if you're lower in spatial awareness and distraction control. Yeah. Makes and perfect that's not sense. Even, and that wasn't even in a, a dynamic shooting environment, right? No, static. The data that targets? I sent you was yeah, dynamic. Yeah, and we found some relationships there. But, I mean, the area we're excited to explore is when we start integrating or, or, or evaluating, you know, more dynamic shooting environments. Mm -hmm. And I think that might be part of the— Well, the, those numbers that I sent you were dynamic shooting environment. The, the distraction control and spatial awareness was popping hot on. But, I mean, the targets weren't moving. No, the targets weren't moving, but they were moving. They were moving. Two positions but the, yeah, to yeah, respond yeah. No, to no, the no, targets. No, no, no. I'm glad you clarified yeah. that because that – you're right. The targets weren't moving. They were moving, which makes right. it – And they've, uh, got to solve, they've got to solve a bunch of tact, uh, kind of tactical problems like where they, they can't overexpose themselves yeah. and they can't – they have yeah. to be tactical about it. And they have to make decisions about managing their weapon systems and their loadouts and – yeah which strategy to use to most effectively engage the targets, but there's a time and accuracy pressure on it big time. Yeah. And that's we where weren't, we're, we weren't introducing like visual distractors no, and no, no, dynamic no. chaotic environment nope. and someone shooting back at you. Nope. And All that is the same. Target and oh. motion. I, you know, that's when these cognitive skills will really be tested to the max. Right. And so the fact that we're seeing in some, I mean, these are still incredibly tough tasks, right? Yeah. <laughs> Moving and shooting yep. a target, as as I observed, was incredibly challenging and, and demanding mm -hmm. in and of itself. We're seeing some basic relationships between their, how your brain is wired and, and how you perform in these. I mean, I can only imagine, you know, in a more dynamic environment uh, or a maximally dynamic environment, mm -hmm. that's where these cognitive skills are really going to start giving you those advantages, disadvantages. Yep. And so when, when we do, like, we don't we don't have any objective data to assess their performance in that dynamic environment and training because yeah. it, 
it's just too complicated right now for yeah. the the technology that we have to do it. But when you start getting into like simulated fire or force on force training, then you know it's advanced paintball. Like everybody's played paintball, not everybody, but enough people have played paintball yeah. that you have to start thinking about like. Where are the, the quote-unquote good guys versus the quote-unquote bad guys? Where are they moving? Where are they most likely to be? Where do I need to be? Who am I talking to on the, the three voices in my ear pro that's going on all the time? There's a lot of stuff going on. Just from a marksmanship standpoint, though, when we put them under time pressure in an unknown environment, because they they're taking instruction as they encounter it, and so they're having to process the instruction, put it into action. The most efficient way will get you done the fastest, which is the goal, and have the fewest amount of misses, which is the goal, right? Then we're seeing those things pop. And those were kind of, frankly, surprised to me. I didn't, I, distraction control was important, right? Yep. But I didn't think it would be that important. So that's been illuminating. And so I started talking to these guys as they're going through it and trying to relate, like, I'm not asking them, hey, how was your distraction control today? Like, that's yeah, not the point. Yeah. But it's like, hey, man, like, you missed four of those eight targets, you're clearly capable of hitting them. Mm -hmm. What's the deal? Well, in the back of my head, I was thinking about this. I had to go here. This was next. This is where I just went and took that shot. Da, 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 da. I'm like, that's maybe not visually distracting, right? Yeah. But it's certainly mentally distracting. Boy, we always talk about uh, the lay idea about distraction is that it interrupts your concentration. But that's not what we're getting at. We're getting at what we might call attention to action. Okay. So when you're in a performance situation mm -hmm. and you've got to execute an action while you're paying attention to process information that guides that action, when you're captured by distraction, it not only interferes with your concentration to what you need to be processing visually mm -hmm. or auditorily, but it interferes with your execution. We know that a distracted mind leads to more variable right. accuracy in your execution. So their shooting on target is going to, the cloud of variability around targets is going to grow if they're distracted or they're thinking about other things. And so it's, it's, it's not just interrupting, you're processing the visual back to the perception you were talking about, but the action part of it as well right. gets, gets, becomes more variable. Yeah. And that, that word interference is the one that seems to resonate with their relationship with distraction control. Yeah, is that right? right? It's yeah. like, hey, we're distraction control. We're not really talking about like how well you can concentrate or how well you can sustain concentration or attention. We're really seeing it like how, what's the interference in your ability to achieve the goal when you have all these other things going on. Like yeah, where that's great. these distractions are creating an interference from between the time that you could have without the distractions made the right button push compared to like when there's a lot of distractions, it interferes with your ability to get there as fast as you can. Yeah. And or so, as accurately. <clears throat> or as accurately. And so when yeah. we start putting that in terms of shoot, move and communicate, then it, that that makes sense yeah. perfectly. It's like, yeah. well, yeah, there was a lot of stuff going on and I had to make sure this was right and that was right and this was right. And it's like, all right. So now we're really getting into the nitty gritty details of how can we shave? Like if you think about your average shooting drill, like let's go to um, a shooting competition, like a USPSA thing, just to keep it PG, right? And one of the um, qualifiers in USPSA is what they call it, El Presidente. So you got three targets, you have to put two rounds in each target, reload your gun, put two rounds in each target as fast as you can. Can't miss, mm -hmm. right? When we start breaking that down, we're talking about the, some of the better shooters on the planet are having split time, so time between shots in the 250 millisecond range. It's right? Some fast. of them faster than that. It turns out that a rifle on full auto is a shot every 100 milliseconds as well as a shot timer can pick it up. So that we're moving pretty fast at oh, that yeah. point, right? So when we start thinking about like what are the things that are interfering with your ability to do that, because if we isolate it back to the like, are we swinging, or are we hitting yeah. in practice? Are we just shooting or are we trying to accomplish a goal with a gun in our hand, right? Then, well, that makes more sense, right? And so, uh, oh, it turns out there there's another drill that they do where they get like 30 seconds to shoot, 
then they get 20 seconds to shoot, and they get 10 seconds to shoot. And so they're all shooting the same round counts and all those different time hacks, right? They're shooting the same target at the same range, same size, everything's the same. But one of the consistent things over 10 years of doing this is that the 10 second group is always the best. Hmm. They get more hits in the 10 second than they do in the 30 second, right? And so when we start, this is why the distraction control numbers started to make real good sense to me. It's because before I knew that about when we really started measuring the stuff at the at the specificity that we're measuring it with you guys, is that from the psychology standpoint, everybody's like, well, oh, I just shoot better when I shoot fast. It's like, mm, Simple does it. I don't know that that's entirely the... Uh, I just need to shoot everything in 10 seconds and we'll be fine. <laughs> I'm, like, yeah. I'm not sure that's the point of the exercise, number one. And number two, I don't think that's 100% accurate. I think that... Because I've had to shoot all those drills. Remember, like, hey, if you're, you don't have any business telling them if you can't do it. And so I experienced their experience because I can't miss. Otherwise, I have no credibility. So I had a pretty genuine student experience, if you will. And then I started playing with it because I got to do the same ones over and over and over again. And it dawned on me pretty soon. I was like, okay, 10 seconds seems like not very much time to shoot 10 rounds. It's the second around, and everybody thinks seconds are really fast until you start thinking about milliseconds, and then seconds seem like a long yep. time. But it's like, all right, well, what's in the 30-second iteration? What were you thinking about? Well, I could see this one missed, and I could see that one wasn't quite right there, and I could see this, and then it's like, okay, now we're getting there. What about the 20-second one? Well, I could still see you know, the impacts and everything. What about the 10-second one? I just held the sights over the black part and pulled the trigger when the sights were on the that's black it, part. That's it. I'm like, okay, so wait a minute. We so you're telling in. me that the 10-second group, you did the three things that make bullet hit, bullets hit targets, and that's it. That's the only thing you thought about? And they're like, oh, shut up. You know, like, yeah. Yeah. Yep. The yeah. realization. All right, and they so maybe what we should do is learn a little bit of discipline on the 30-second one so that you can separate your shots Right, like the old baseball example, like separate your pitches, separate your pitches, separate your at-bats, separate your innings, separate whatever, right? And let's just think about the three things that make the bullets go where we want them to. Sights align on target, trigger squeeze without disrupting them. Sights back on target, trigger squeeze without disrupting them, right? Like hold the thing, that's keep number moving. one. Keep yeah. moving. Right, and just move on. Because in the last year and a half, I've watched 288 guys shoot this uh, training program, right? Which they shoot this drill four times over the course of the training program. So yeah. I've seen 1,200 of these drills shot and the vast, vast majority of them, the 10 second iteration is the best, yeah. right? And it's it's like, that's the Jedi mind trick is we took the distraction control away from it by decreasing your time for you to do it. Yeah. And so Without you elim- even knowing. You eliminated this, we eliminated the static unknowingly and we didn't give you time to introduce the static or even acknowledge that it existed. You just went there. And that's, I've got the the distinct opportunity to talk to a lot of guys about a lot of different gunfights and a lot of different generations of gunfighting. And one of the things that that they've shared with me is that like they have a flow experience sometimes mm-hmm. and they don't know how to perceive it. Because they didn't go to sports psychology school. I mean, they know what being in the zone is like, the common vernacular. But it's a little bit weird when it's like, man, my dot just stuck to things. Yeah. My dot is like red dot at their site. It's like it just stuck to things and I could I could see things that I didn't, like time slowed down. Like they're talking about the autotelic experience, right? They're yeah. talking about yeah. the merging of action and awareness and like all the cheek sent me high flow stuff. Like they're describing it verbatim without using the academic language for it. And so, all right, if that's the ideal state, like we don't want to put them there in a situation where, or they're not getting there because they think their life is at risk. That's not good for anybody. But if we can set the conditions and give them an experience where, man, that was really hard or, whoa, that got real easy, real fast. Yeah. Now we can do that better because we have a better understanding of the cognitive, like the actual cognitive side, not their heart rate, not their HRV, not their respiration rate, but the actual cognitive side of what they're experiencing. And now we can talk about it and then they can teach me about it. And so I work a lot with the, uh, the guys that shoot the long range stuff, 
right? And that's one of them that we thought, like, I think both of us thought distraction control would be a huge deal in. Like, we could probably predict who the best long-range shooters are going to be based on distraction control because it seemed, like, intuitively it makes a lot of sense. But I've also got a lot of training in what goes into making a precision shot out at 800 to 1,000 meters. There's a lot of rules, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. If this, then that. Yeah, give us a few. Like, well, you have to know how fast the wind is blowing. You have to know how fast your bullet's moving. And you have to know how the density of the air is going to affect your muzzle velocity and how far that bullet's going to go and how much it's going to slow down and how much wind is it going to take to move that bullet and how much wind is going to move it how far, right? So they're they're doing all of that before they send that round. And so really they're kind of predicting the future based on a guess of how fast the wind is blowing, where the bullet's moving the slowest. And it could be changing. And it's constantly changing, yeah. right? Constantly yeah. changing. And so when you start thinking about like, yeah, is it pretty easy to teach somebody to lay on their belly and, and hold a gun really still and, and squeeze the trigger without disrupting the sights? Yeah, my 11-year-old is really good at it, really good at it. He's interested in it, though, mm-hmm. right? And he's he's really good at it, especially for an 11-year-old. But we're not dealing with 11-year-olds. Like We're dealing with adults who are highly motivated and highly skilled to do this. And so they know the rules, then what part of this is creating the misses? Outside of the technical capabilities of being able to predict wind speed and yeah. doing all that other stuff, but there's a lot of rules that they're going through before they send these bullets down range, right? And so it's probably closer to decision complexity, yeah, yeah. right? Because I have if the wind is blowing from this direction at this speed, that changes how much it's going to move the bullet. And so there's this constant observation of wind speed, wind direction, a computation to figure out what that variable is. And then we know how far the target is, at least when you're shooting steel targets, they don't move that well, right? Yep. But you start getting <laughs> Better some... Better than most. <clears throat> you yeah. get some targets that do move around, which anybody Ends in the competition the world is familiar with the target, the little robot targets that move around. And so once... Like there's a lot of if-then things going on. You're, you're constantly having to hold it in mind, update it. Yep make new calculations and the more of those rules you can update in a shorter period of time. Right. And so the decision complexity part is definitely, but response flexibility is also in there, right? Because you're now your counter reaction, your initial reaction. Yeah. So like, Oh, we've got a four mile an hour win from the seven thirty, which is going to be this percentage of this and this percentage of that. And all right, hold wind call. But as the shooter's getting ready to take the shot and putting his reticle on the target where it needs to be so that the bullet will go in the right spot or the correct spot, then the wind's changing. And so it's just a constant, like, it starts with decision complexity to get the baseline, but then it's response flexibility at the end, Yeah. right? Improvise. Especially if there's the multiple adjustment. targets in a single engagement, So, which happens a lot in training. Again, like the understanding that I'm gathering of how these kind of split-second things and they're not doing it in 200 milliseconds. Right. Right. They're more than capable of engaging targets faster than average people. But we're still not talking about like, oh, you've got five targets at, at somewhere between 600 and 1,000 meters. Then we know based on the S2 data that you should be able to shoot this in 1.4 yeah, seconds. Yeah, it's yeah. like, no, man, that ain't how it works. That's not how it works. Right. But we understand the mechanisms of action underneath it. Right. With the if then rules and the improvisation and or response flexibility. I like response flexibility better. But <laughs> you um, named it. You know what I'm saying? It's yeah, like once we understand once we understand what all those little mechanisms are doing, and then that relates again, relates to their experience and they're learning all these formulas and they're learning all these processes and it's frustrating. It's just, and it helps the individual learn how to adapt. They adapt so much faster. Yeah, when they yeah. know what the things are that uh, could get them in trouble, the yep. air sources of inconsistency, the sources of being, having a mental mistake. And if you understand that, these things happen so fast. and are, A lot of these cognitive systems are outside of our, our conscious awareness. We can't really quantify them. Mm-hmm. You know, I can throw a baseball, and I can tell you right now, I don't have the velocity that I did of my, my youth. Mm-hmm. Um I can appreciate that, but these decision systems are are hard for us to really capture in real time and understand how good they are or how inconsistent they are. 
And and so understanding that will put you in a position to be able to adapt and anticipate yeah, no, and I, where and these again, guys, like you said, and they are the masters of of adaptation. And I think that's really the the beauty of the whole thing is that we're getting the data outside of any of the context that they'll experience it. Yeah. But it, it is relatable to what they're doing, and we can translate it into being relatable to what they're doing. And at the end of the day, the the metrics that they care about are things like hits and misses, yeah. right? Accuracy, speed of accuracy. Those are the metrics that they're interested in. And if they're going to keep asking me to come out and help them, those are the things I need to help them get better at. And so, yeah, it doesn't like you can't take the S2 test and then go talk to Dr. Seth for 15 minutes and then take the S2 test again and be better. Right. Like yeah. That ain't going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. Right? That's not what we're after, though. What we're after is like, all right, now that we understand what makes you tick a little bit more specifically, then when we get into the training environment and we start making mistakes, we have fewer variables to try to figure out. Right? Like, right. Hey, we know that this task is probably pretty heavy decision complexity, response flexibility, and maybe a little bit of like search efficiency, right? Like we know that those are probably the three driving forces here cognitively. And we know that you're really good at one of them, which has probably made you really lazy in the other one. But like you got to lean on the lazy one right now. And so like let's talk about it in those terms, right? And we'll translate it so that we're not using any academic language or anything like that. And we'll put it in the context of long-range marksmanship or something along those lines. So mm -hmm. they don't think that we're talking science to them. We're talking shooting. Yeah. And now we're in. It helps them with their confidence. It helps them with their motivation. And frankly, it helps them a little bit with their resilience because nobody likes to fail. And these guys particularly in kind of a no-fail environment most of the time, right? And so failure is not something like everybody understands the concept of like, we need to train ourselves to failure. We need to find our limits. We need to push past and that's how we get better. And they get that. But man, too many failures is not a good thing. Right. And what's, right? what's more frustrating than experiencing failures or, or mistakes, but not knowing why, not understanding why, right. and not having a clue about what to do about it? Yeah. yeah. And mm -hmm. where do we go from here? That's yeah. the biggest thing, right? I don't know how I'm failing. I don't know why. And now I don't know what to do with it. Yeah. And it's helped me as a, as a professional in the field make answer some of those questions. Because even if I don't know the like the tactical answer, which is usually the case, because again, I don't have any of this tactical experience. All of the stuff I've got is like, sometimes I feel like the, the dad at the little league game, right? Like living vicariously through their kid on the field, right? Like I don't really know what it's like. Dad doesn't know. I do that to some of my, that's right. I've said that to a couple of little league coaches. Like you can either shut up and stop yelling at your kid, or you can come out here and I'll hit fungos to you and we'll see how good you do. <laughs> right. Hey, speaking of little league stories, Seth, this last summer we had the, uh, the unexpected experience of having our two boys play each other in a That's tournament right. game. That's yeah. right. And this no was a way. championship, right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Now, now uh, to be fair, his son and their team were playing up. A level, mm -hmm. and so that's how talented his yeah. kid is. We, they were playing there, and well, so <laughs> that explains why we pounded you in the championship. Wow. But it wow. was. Uh, but well, it, I think it, we it need was... to check some birth certificates because some of those kids <laughs> were not yeah. twelve. This years is old. Yeah. Yeah. Some yeah. of those kids were not twelve. But, but this Danny was... Almani, was, <laughs> dad am, was there. I am twelve. Sure. <laughs> this this uh, eh, that aside, there was. And, and we're not much of a chirping bunch, right? Mm -hmm. our, our parents are, are pretty good folks, and I'm sure you would say the same about your parents. But what I did know going, you know, just because I've been around Seth, I knew that a lot of the players on his teams, their their dads were special forces. So you have a few special forces on your on your team. Mm -hmm. One and, of them was a first base coach. Yes, and a couple in the stands. And I, I forget what was the... Your, oh, one of your guys oh, ran into my kid at first base. That's right. That's right. Oh, boy. His kid at first base got in the way of My kid's of playing one of first our... base, and he's... No, I'm kidding. He's, he's a year younger than everybody else on the field, and so he's shorter than them, right? Yeah. And they have some monsters on their team, right? That yeah, have as, you seen him? As my kid would say, like, caught the puberty early. Yeah. And they just had a collision, 
They had a collision. I saw it as like one kid's running to first as fast as he can, the other yeah, kid's doing yeah. his best to catch the I th- ball, and I those think two both, things intersected. I think we both agree, though, that probably if there was a little bit of fault, it, oh, was, it was our player's team, our player on our team who... who I would have done the same thing if I was running to first. That's right. <laughs> Seth would have, except the guy wouldn't have got up. Parents started chirping. And I mean, it kind of went on, and it was getting a little heated and a little testy, and of course, and Seth was sitting up there. He He's kind of like me. We kind of stay isolated during the game because we don't like to listen to all the chirpiness. I uh, could quickly see things were elevating in terms of the intensity. And so I, I walked over to Seth and I said, Hey, whatever happens here, if this goes to blows, just tell you guys to leave me out of it. <laughs> because I don't think our parents understand who's in the who's stands across over the street. Here. No. We would have been <laughs> annihilated. They so the, fortunately cooler heads prevail, yeah. but <laughs> it would have been eventually it, a it, bloodbath. It, it turns out it's just boys being boys, but that it's kind of funny cuz one of the guys that that I work with was coaching first base cuz his kid was on the team and you know hothead dad is tripping at hothead grandma or whatever it was and Hothead grandma? Yeah, there's always Moms are real protective of their little boys. I get that. So, it was instigated by grandparents. It, it I gets, mean, chirping. It gets a little chirpy, and so I have a. I don't have much of an inside voice sometimes, and so I was just like, "Stop it! It's my kid. He's fine. Stop it! Like, yeah. just let him play." And so my wife's mad now because I'm in the middle of it, yeah. and then the dude coaching first base, who I know professionally, who is just a guy in the world, right? Like these guys are pretty normal people in the world. He sticks his head out of the dugout. He looks at me, and I'm like, we got it. And he's like, all right. And after the game, he was like, when you said you got it, I was good, but I was ready to go. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. I, that's that what I was good. worried about. I spent the rest of the game like, walking around our, our, <laughs> our parents and saying, hey, by the way, let me tell you a little bit of background on this other team. <laughs> Unless you want to go home in a body bag, I suggest you stop chirping. That Matter of fact, that I think happen. we should start cheering on the other team. That that wouldn't happen. They're they're uh, like I said, they're they don't avoid conflict, but they've got some. Their impulse control is pretty good when it comes to real life stuff. Hmm. This is a very great segue into the next part, final part of our podcast, which is the random and or funny three questions that we give each guest that comes on the show. Are you ready? Shoot. Okay. I, I don't think you're going to like them. And I, I guarantee you, you're going to know who promise, came up with this first. Promise one. that I'm not going to like them. Okay. Halloween was recent. Agreed. What's the best and worst costume that you've ever seen, whether you were in it, preferably, or not? I can this, I, this I'm going to pull this a, fast is a PG one. podcast, right? Okay. What is the best and worst costume you've ever worn? No, don't, let's not give them an out here. Don't give them an out? Okay. No. All right. Shape it up. I've never been much of a costume guy. Wow, you shocking. May not, that you may not believe that me. about me. Yeah. Um, most of the costumes that I've deliberately put on has been at the request of my wife. Because <laughs> when they have your first child, right, Halloween's a big deal. And apparently you have to go as a family themed. You should so know better. Probably the best one was Fred Flintstone. Nice. Right? I, had ah. the, I had the big felt Were you orange. barefoot? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. Committed. And I was in better shape, so I was looking a little bit <laughs> bigger. That is a Jack a, Fred a little bit bigger, yeah. you know? Yeah. And carrying a little Bam Bam around, and wife is dressed as Wilma, of course. So that was probably the best one. The worst one, same scheme, same maneuver, except it was Pirates of the Caribbean. Ah. And we just looked like trashy pirates. You know, ah. it's just It wasn't good. The kid wasn't happy because there was a bunch of strangers, and he's just crying the whole time, and... It was a mess, yeah. but yeah, that's probably the the best and worst was Fred Flintstone was the best. Um, as a kid, it was mostly about the candy, Yeah, right? And number one candy for you is? No, there's not a number one. Oh, okay. Whoppers are the only thing that are off the table. Okay. All right. Uh, people get particular Everything about their candy. Everything else is pretty good. It is I've all about a, the candy. My, it is 100% about the candy. My son just got on my case yesterday because he says, you know... When I'm older and I have kids and we're talking about Halloween, oh, they're going to ask me, what did you dress up at, Dad? And I'm going to say, well, my dad made me go as a baseball player every year. And I just wore the last season's baseball jersey. Yeah. We had a Benny the Jet. I'm pretty and lame. Ate, and just ate the candy. I'm pretty lame. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This one's a little bit more serious. Sorry. I'm still thinking about candy. You're still on candy? Yeah. Okay. I got a sweet tooth for sure. Okay. 
Caramel apple suckers are a go-to. They give that away at Halloween? I've lost a number of fillings to one of those. <laughs> yeah. Um, as a civilian, was it hard to gain the respect of special forces operators? Yes and no. The yes part was they didn't trust me, which means they didn't like me. Um, they It wasn't the first time that they've had a civilian being thrown in there to quote unquote train them. And they do a very specific task that not very many people are asked to do. And so they hold those skill sets in pretty high regard, <laughs> right? And they do a lot of training to get to the level that they're at. And for somebody to just come up the street and say, oh, well, you need to think about it like this, then they're going to be real defensive of that territory, which makes perfect sense right. when you look at it from their perspective. So yes, it was hard to gain their respect um, from a technical, professional perspective. Um, the no part of that is these are all pretty genuine human beings that if you think about the experiences that being a human include, right, and you boil that down to the elements, this is just world according to Seth right now, but um, it's living, dying, and killing, right? If we boil the human experience down, living is probably the most complicated of those elements, right? Dying is the the part that is least known. Just everybody gets to do that once so mm, far. right? And then the killing part is not something that everybody has the experience with. And it's the one that is kind of the one that nobody wants to talk about, right? As a civilian, the worst question you can ask a veteran is the kill question, right? Because it's just disrespectful. But we don't understand why it's disrespectful, right? Um, so these guys have this this very extensive experience with the living part, with the dying part, right, and the killing part. And so to earn their respect as a human in the world, like if you're just a genuine, respectable person that is there doing the right thing for the right reasons, like they'll respect that because that's what they need. That's what they're looking for. So on one end, no, it was really easy to earn their respect because if you're just a good person on the planet trying to do the right thing for the right people, like you're, that's respectable. Like that's the expectation hmm. almost. On the the tactical, technical, professional side, absolutely it was hard to earn their respect. And it's something that, you know, as soft and fuzzy as it might be, it's relationship-based. I mean, the, the commodity is trust. And, you know, they deal with things that, that we don't talk about a lot for various reasons, but they need to trust you that you're not going to expose them, that you're not going to, like, that's one of the biggest threats when we started talking about S2 is that, hey, are we going to open a Pandora's box that says, whoa, we've got some guys that compared to everyone else maybe shouldn't be here. And so far that hasn't been the case, Yeah. right? But that trust is something that professionally and personally I have, I protect first, yeah. right? And so from the respect standpoint, as a person in the world, they're genuinely good people who are genuinely there to protect the people that can't protect themselves. Like, that's why they signed up for this. Yeah. Be a good dude in the world, and respect is pretty easy to earn there. Tactically, different story. I learned that lesson as a 12-year-old. You want to talk about not being aware, right? The awareness of a middle schooler and a substitute teacher comes in, and he was a Vietnam vet, and I just asked him a question, that question in front of everyone. And it was very clear to me to never ask that question mm -hmm. to a veteran. Yeah. And that's how I learned. Yeah. And it's when you're kind of in the, like, the advantage of my job is that I'm embedded in one specific unit, right? <clears throat> one specific organization. And so I get to know their culture and their, and their understanding of it. And it's not something that anybody's really comfortable talking about. And frankly, to them, it's not that important. Right. Like the mission is more important. And, and those are things that, but they're, it's difficult to deal with yeah. for sure. Right. And so it doesn't take long to figure that out. Just in general, I think common sense yeah. would get you there. Like right. as a 12 year old, that's an understandable Tough. mistake. As an adult, it's probably not an understandable mistake. But as a 12 year old, we'll give you some grace. And the response and would be far like, different if I asked now. You learn today. Right. right? Yeah. Um, but yeah, getting their respect is definitely um, an important 
function of my profession, specifically in special operations, being genuine, authentic person will get it real fast. Yeah. On the tactical side, it, you're going to take some bumps and bruises along the way for sure. Last question. As much as you can divulge or are interested in, can you tell us about one of the crazier ops you've heard about? I'll tell you, I'll, I'll answer this question with this. Okay. There's a guy that was in his prime well before I was introduced to special operations in the military, who's a bit of a legend for the missions and events of his professional military career. Everybody knows him as as kind of like on one level, um, like kind of like prototypical is not the right word, but like stereotypical is probably better of like big, strong, hyper aggressive, like the guy that everybody's afraid of, right? Like get him out of there. And I never really got to know him be just the timelines didn't match up, but he was still around and people were talking about him and he was working with one of the strength coaches towards the end of his career. And the strength coach got to know him a little bit. And he's not an easy guy to get to know, right? And so he said that he was writing a book about his experiences. And everybody's like, oh, man, this is going to be amazing. He's like, I keep writing this book. And I think I'm at 300 pages. But every time I read it, I just can't publish it because it's just a comedy of all the things that I effed up. You know? <laughs> and it's like, so when... When people get to know what I do for a living, they're like, oh, man, that, that question comes right. up quite a bit. It's like, what's the craziest thing that you've ever heard about them sure. doing? And for the most part, all the crazy stuff happens when there's a mistake, right? Like, oh, we did something that was stupid or in hindsight was stupid. We didn't do it on, stupid Intentional. unintentionally, right. but um, it's like this comedy of errors. And it's kind of a weird space to be in as a civilian, right? Because it's like, hey, like I can... Junior college baseball players were thinking like every at bat was life and death. And like, we're like, do we need to call your, like, do we need to have yeah. somebody watch you for the next 24 hours? Cause you just went over four with four punch outs, you know? And these guys are doing life and death stuff. And it, they're just like, that was the dumbest thing I've ever seen you do. You're going <laughs> to yes. get all of us killed. It's just this, but that's part of the learning, the learning part of it, right? So from the a crazy operation standpoint, I've seen guys do things that, most average people would say that's insane. Nobody in their right mind would do those kind of things, yeah. right? But that's what they're trained to do. And that's, I mean, it's not like they were trained to do this. Like those type of people gravitate towards that type of work, right? And it's not as easy as like, oh, you're just a sensation seeker or a thrill seeker. And so you're going to go you're right. do this thing. It's like they, for the most part, they do have a genuine, like, visceral reaction to protecting people that can't protect themselves. Yeah. Like, most of them, I, I always have, like, an inside joke with them. It's like, well, this is the place where all the middle school bullies, like, reconvene when it's adults, <laughs> right? Because they're all pretty rough around the edges, and they don't pull punches, and they speak in straight lines, and you know exactly where you stand with them. And they're amazing people to be around. But, like, m well, my wife... In the first couple of years that we were here, I was coming home from work and we're around a lot of sudden loud noises, a lot of shooting, a lot of like simulated violence, right? In the training environment. And I just, I'm generally higher on the intensity scale or the emotionality scale than most people already. And I'm just kind of like, I'm happy. I can get home and we're sitting at the dinner table and I'm like, hey, what did you do? Hey, what did you do? Hey, what did you do? Hey, don't do that. Da, 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 da. And my wife has stopped me and be like, hey, I'm glad you found your people that you can talk to like that. They don't live here. <laughs> Tone it yeah. down. Yeah. Right. And so from a crazy, like, what are the, what's the craziest thing you've ever heard on an op is like, it's all about perspective and you get the right people in the right job doing the right thing. And then you train them to do it very well. It doesn't seem as crazy anymore. Right. right? It seems pretty normal, but yeah. most of the, most of the, like to the intention of your question is that, Probably nothing that I could divulge. I didn't think so. However, the stories that they laugh about are ones that are like 
oh man, we did the dumbest thing ever, or yeah. we made the stupid yeah. mistake. You know, like uh, hey, you remember that time when you? <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's right. And they're all laughing about it, and then it's like, ooh, that, this is starting to get a little bit <laughs> intense for for most people. Yeah. You know, so no, no crazy stories about. Um, Maybe next time. Crazy ops. Maybe next time I'll. You're there to run the test. I'll point somebody okay. in your general direction okay. and see how. Hey man, thanks for joining us. Really Absolutely. appreciate it. Thanks for Long. thanks for having me here. This is great, Seth. Appreciate you, man. Yep. Um. Uh, hopefully, we can continue moving this down the field. I think some of the new, the new technology that's available, that wasn't available four years ago when we started this thing, is going to really help us push it down the field. So we're looking forward to it. Thanks for listening to the S2 Cognition Podcast and today's part two episode with Special Operations Forces Mental Performance Specialist, Seth Hazelhoon. If you like the content we're putting out, please subscribe with that plus sign at the top of your app, leave a review about the episode, and share it with a friend. Follow us on Twitter at S2 Cognition and Instagram at S2.Cognition. If you'd like to get in touch with the show, please visit our website at S2Cognition.com slash podcast. Thanks again for listening to the S2 Cognition podcast. I'm your host, Harrison Hunter, signing off for now. We'll talk to you on our next episode.